Well, good day to everybody tuning into this sermon on Psalm 37. So hear the word of the Lord. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it only tends to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more, though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. <clears throat> the wicked draws the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is a little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. <clears throat> they are not to put to shame in evil times, in the days of famine they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish. Like smoke, they vanish away. The wicked borrows, but does not pay back. But the righteous is generous and gives. <clears throat> For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. But those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong. For the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so shall you dwell forever, for the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints, they are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart, his steps do not slip. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power, <clears throat> or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. I have seen... A wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. But he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Then I sought him, he could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright. For there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall altogether be destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this psalm of wisdom. And we pray that we would receive wisdom from your hand, wisdom from you. And Lord, that we'd respond with faith and obedience and commitment to you. We do confess our sins now and cry out you'd have mercy upon us. And we ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would come and change us and transform us. In Jesus' good name, amen. Why do the evil people prosper and seem to be doing better than us? That's a question, a question that often springs from jealousy or anger, but it's still a valid question as you read the Bible. Now, this question is debated among people among the world, so I went to, to Twitter to see what people were saying about rich evil people and Twitter did not disappoint. For instance, 
Jack Soto says that rich people stay rich because of racism. Real estate has always been the main ways white people have been able to stay rich generationally. It's an evil and predatory system that will hopefully be phased out before the 22nd century. What banks and landlords are doing is just disgusting. A lady named Gets in that sense says, Granny used to tell me, son, you never want to be too rich because people who are too rich are involved themselves in evil things. Just have what you can take care of your needs and make the family happy. R.I.P. Grandma. Subharathana says, All rich people are inherently evil. Now even Christians get into this idea that rich people are evil. A Christian put out a video explaining why rich people are evil. And it says 10 reasons. They learn the system. They beat the system. They're master deceivers. They're ruthless. They make evil deeds. They overpromise and underliver. They focus on their reputation. They always boast. They worship results. And this last one, they worship the devil. Well, Psalm 37 deals with the issue of why do evil people prosper? Psalm 37 does not say all rich people are evil, but Psalm 37 deals with the struggle of David seeing wicked people around him prevail and even be over him. But the fate of the wicked is actually very clear here in this psalm. Although they seem to prevail, they'll be cut off. The righteous, the meek, and those who seek the Lord will inherit the land. Psalm 37, as you see, is a psalm written by King David. As the subscript says, it's just one word in the Hebrew, La David, here it's of David. Psalm 37 is a wisdom psalm. This means that David, as he writes this psalm, is explaining wise living. David is dealing with two types of people in this psalm. First, the righteous. Next, the wicked. And if you highlight every reference to the righteous and to the wicked, it will be very obvious to you that there is a great contrast between these two types of people. The righteous are those who have been saved by God's grace. They experience God's deliverance, as you see in verse 39 and 40. And they trust the Lord. They seek the Lord. They live humble before the Lord. The wicked <coughs> are described as those who live without rever reference or reverence to God. They live in rebellion against God, and we see that in Psalm 37. Psalm 37, as well, is an acrostic psalm. This is a poetic term. This means that the first sentence starts with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then the second phrase or sentence starts with the second. And then the third and the fourth. All the way to the end of the Hebrew alphabet. Biblical authors often used acrostic, this technique, to help people memorize the psalm as well. The psalmist could be saying, we're going to give you the, really the A to the Z on the wicked versus the righteous. Although there's great debate on the outline of the psalm, I'm going to give the outline as follows. Verse 1 to 11, we have a, a smacking of many commands, so we're going to call that trust in the Lord. The, the next section, verse 12 to 22, we see the fate of the wicked. Verse 23 to 29, we see the blessings of the faithful. Verse 30 to 38, we kind of go back and forth between the fate of the righteous and the fate of the wicked and the contrast between those two types. And verse 39 to 40 clearly is speaking about the Lord saving his people. Because this psalm is so many verses, we're going to be looking at this psalm more topically and just going to highlight three themes. First, we're going to highlight who the Lord is and his work. Next, we're going to highlight the wicked, their actions, and their fate. And then finally, we're going to look at the righteous, their actions, and their inheritance. But first, we're going to look at the Lord and His work. Psalm 37 teaches us some amazing truths about the Lord, and we're going to be really highlighting five of them. First, the Lord is a faithful God, and we see this clearly in Psalm 37. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to see that the Lord is faithful. It's evident. It's clear. The Lord keeps his promises, and none of his promises will ever fail. 
in Psalm 37, verse 3, and verse 5, the psalmist calls us to trust in the Lord. Now, why can we trust in the Lord? Because the Lord is a faithful God. And if the Lord wasn't faithful, he would not call us to trust in the Lord. As well, we see in verse 33, the Lord will not allow the righteous to be consumed by the wicked because the Lord is a faithful God. Look at verse 33. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. The Lord is a faithful God. Next, Psalm 37 declares that the Lord is holy. We see a clear picture of the holiness of God, which means that God is different than us humans. He's pure. He's blameless. He's without sin. His thoughts are not our thoughts. First, we see in Psalm 37, verse 13, we see this contrast. The wicked, verse 12, the wicked plots against the righteous, gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. We see the holiness of God here. And we see as well what Psalm 2 says about the Lord as the nations rise up against the Messiah. In Psalm 2 verse 4 it says, He sits in heavens and laughs. The Lord in heaven uh, holds them in derision. Now I remember reading Psalm 2 verse 4 in a Bible study and a very opinionated person in that Bible study said, The Lord in heaven doesn't laugh at people. Although it clearly says that in Psalm verse 2 and in Psalm 37, verse 30, uh, in verse 13. This person only saw God as a touchy, feely love. And this person was uncomfortable and did not like and maybe even hated this idea of the holiness of God. And because they had this dislike of God's holiness, they distorted the scriptures so that the God they created could be more comfortable for people and for them. But not only did they distort the view of God, it led them to publicly deny the authenticity of the scriptures of the word of God that teach the holiness of God. Idolatry and sin can lead us in dangerous places. As well, we see in Psalm 37 verse 28 that the Lord loves justice. The Lord loves justice because he is a pure and holy God. Next, the Lord is all-knowing. Now, when we think about God being all-knowing, we can think of Psalm 139. It speaks very clearly of God's omniscience. And Psalm 37 speaks about the Lord knowing all the days of the blameless, as we see there in Psalm 37. Number four, the Lord is sovereign. God is sovereign, and that means he's over everything that happens on the face of the earth. In Psalm 37, verse 23, David declares God's sovereignty, saying the steps of man are established by the Lord. The Lord establishes, the Lord rules over all, all people, because he's a sovereign God. And finally, the Lord is gracious. We see the amazing grace of God in his work of salvation at the end of Psalm 37, in verse 39 and 40, a very important verse in Two verses in Psalm 37. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in them. Here we see in this psalm a very important truth. Salvation comes from the Lord. The Lord delivers. The Lord delivers and saves. God is gracious because he gives his salvation and brings deliverance to his people. So now we can, we've looked at the Lord. Now we can look at our next point, the wicked and their actions. As I said earlier, Psalm 37 is a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. The wicked are described in great detail. Psalm 37 verse 1 calls the wicked evildoers or wrongdoers. You see that in verse 1. The wicked are bent on disobeying God. They commit their lives to a sinful course with no regard for the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 7 says they carry out evil devices or schemes. 
verse 12 and 14, the wicked are described as people who plot against God's people. They're people who are characterized by violence. Verse 21 of Psalm 37, the wicked borrow but don't give back because they're people who are bent on stealing. Psalm 37, verse 32, the wicked are described as people of hate and murder. These are the types of people that you don't want as your best friend. They want to murder, they want to steal, they're bent on violence, and they're committed to sin. But this is what we all are apart from God's grace. This is what we are apart from Jesus Christ. And, but if you're a Christian, Jesus Christ has touched you, he's forgiven you, he's changed you, and you have new life. The fate of the wicked is also described in great detail, very shockingly and alarmingly. Psalm 37, verse 2, the wicked will fade like grass. Verse 9, the evildoers will be cut off. Verse 10, the wicked will be no more. Verse 13, the Lord knows that the day of wicked is coming. Verse 14 and 15, the wicked draw their swords with the intent on injuring the righteous, but they end up stabbing themselves. They, they're intent on violence. They do violence to themselves, and they're destroyed. Psalm 37, verse 20 is very clear about the fate of the wicked. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish. They smoke. They vanish away. In Psalm 37, verse 28 and 34 the wicked will be cut off. Now I know many people in our culture delight themselves and brag about their wickedness, the sins they've committed. They just are so prideful in what they indulge in and how they want nothing to do with living for the Lord. But this passage clearly teaches us the dangerous fate the warning to the wicked that those who do not make the Lord their God, who do not delight in the Lord, who find joy in the Lord, trust in the Lord, commit their way to the Lord, they will perish. If they reject God, they will be cut off. They will fade. They will be no more. And finally, let's look at the righteous and their inheritance. The righteous, of course, are those that acknowledge their sin before the Lord and depend upon the Lord for mercy. They've experienced what verse 39 and 40 says, that they've received this salvation from the Lord. They've acknowledged that the Lord delivers them and saves them. But as well, the righteous live with reference to the Lord. And the righteous are described as people who live out in obedience to the Lord. Now, David gives numerous commands that describe the life of a righteous person. In 37 verse 4, they trust the Lord. Verse 4, they delight themselves in the Lord. The Lord is their joy. Verse 5, they commit their way to the Lord. Their lives are committed to the Lord. They are still before the Lord. They wait in humility before the Lord in verse 7. They refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Psalm 37 verse 8. The righteous belong to the Lord and they know that the Lord is over their lives. Here verse 18 and 19. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their heart and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine they have abundance. The fate of the righteous is very clear in Psalm 37 because their fate is described numerous times. They will inherit the land which it says five times. And the land that David is referring to here is the promised land that was given to Israel. The issue that David talks about in Psalm 37 is that the wicked are in the land and are violent towards the righteous who are also in the land. The judgment to the wicked is clear. They will be cut off, but the righteous will inherit the land. This promise was fulfilled and given to Abraham that he would inherit the land. It's the first promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 1. And this promise was fulfilled in the book of Joshua when Israel settles in the land. But Israel did not fully obey the Lord. We see this in Joshua. 
They allowed foreign nations to stay, and they became a snare to the Israelites, so much so that even the Philistines reigned over parts of Israel. But the Lord one day at the coming of Christ will make all things new and give his eternal land promise to his people the hope of heaven. That's the fate or the joy or the promise to the righteous. They will have the hope of being with God in God's dwelling forever in heaven. Well, how does this psalm apply to our hearts and our lives? First, I encourage you to look at the beauty of the Lord, not just in Psalm 37, but every time you get into the Word of God. We can discover the beauty of the Lord and every time we open up the Word of God. All you have to do, it's very simple, you just highlight every time that the Lord or God or Jesus is mentioned, and then you can write down what the passage is teaching you about the Lord. I've been reading the book of Judges and here in the book of Judges, you see not only the punishment of God, but the grace of God. Because I've been highlighting every time the Lord is mentioned. And I think about the work of the Lord, of his deliverance. He heals, hears Israel moaning because of the oppression of the foreign nations. And he sends a judge to bring deliverance. And we see God's grace, even in the book of Judges. In Psalm 37, we see so many amazing truths about the Lord. We see that the Lord is a God of joy. And we can know this because we're called to delight ourselves in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We see that the Lord is a holy God. In Psalm 37 verse 12 to 3. The wicked draw plots against God's people. But what's the Lord's response? The Lord laughs at the wicked because he's a holy God and he will call them to account. Psalm 37, verse 13, But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The Lord is a sovereign God who rules not only over each one of our lives, but over all creation. We see this in Psalm 37, verse 23, The steps of man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. God is sovereign. In Psalm 37, verse 39, David says that the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. The Lord is a God of salvation and deliverance. The Lord is a gracious God and merciful God. There are so many amazing passages that are spoken to us here. Amazing truths about the Lord in Psalm 37. But there are so many sinful messages that are spoken to us throughout the day. We see this. We hear this. We're beaten down by sin. We're, we're tempted we give in to sin. But let us ground ourselves in God Most High. Let us fill our mind with God. Get into the Word and meditate upon who God is and His glory. And let's look at this next application. Let us look at the beauty of God's grace. Psalm 37 speaks clearly about the beauty of the grace of God and clearly points us to the work of Christ and His good news. Hear Psalm 37, 39 and 40 again. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they have taken refuge in him. Salvation is from the Lord. This means that salvation does not depend upon us, but completely depends upon God's grace given to people who do not deserve it. The book of Jonah can again help us understand Psalm 37, much like it helped us understand this similar phrase that we see in Psalm verse 3 and 9. Jonah, because of his rebellion, is thrown into the water and is swallowed by a large fish. Jonah prays from the belly of the fish, while he's in there and his last phrase in his prayer is salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah is humbled and depends upon God's deliverance. And how does the Lord act for Jonah in the next verse? You see it in 2 verse 10. The Lord speaks to the fish and vomits Jonah onto the dry land. Dry land. Jonah could not save himself in the belly of this large fish. 
He needed deliverance and salvation from God. Only God could deliver Jonah. Only God can deliver us from the sin mess that we have put ourselves in. We, by our actions, our thoughts, and words, have rebelled against God. Our sin puts us at, out of fellowship with God. And God needs to save us. We need deliverance that only can come from God. There's nothing more disturbing when I hear someone say that they're Christian because they did X, Y, Z. No, no, no. X is no, Y is no, Z is no. We can only be Christians by the grace of God given to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ bore this punishment of God so that we could escape God's punishment for our sin. And Jesus sets us free. Free from sin's consequences of his wrath, but also free to live a holy and righteous life. It's all by grace. Paul speaks about how this salvation comes from the Lord in the book of Ephesians. 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you're saved by Christ today, delight yourself in the Lord and the grace that he gives. If you're saved by Christ, fret not and do not fear because of the wonderful grace given to you by Jesus Christ. If you're saved by Christ, don't fear when evil people prosper because they're really not prospering because they don't know the joy and the delight of Christ. Today, if you're outside of Jesus Christ, even if you have lots of stuff and you are prospering, knowing that only Jesus, you need to know that only Jesus can save you and deliver you. If you've acknowledged your wickedness before God and know that you need Christ, this psalm gives you direction. Trust the Lord. Commit your way or your life to the Lord. And be still for, before the Lord. Find rest and joy in the Lord today if you do not know him. Next, let's look at the beauty of God's hope. This psalm talks a lot about people inheriting the land. For instance, Psalm 37 verse 9. Those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. Verse 11. The meek will inherit the land. Verse 22, those blessed by the Lord will inherit the land. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land. Verse 34, the Lord will exalt those who wait for the Lord and keep the way of the Lord, and they will inherit the land. This is a quote from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ quotes this psalm in the Sermon on the Mount when he's giving the Beatitudes, and he says, Blessed are those who are joyful are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus speaks about those who are humble before the Lord, they'll inherit the wonderful promise of the land. The land that Jesus promises us is not a hobby farm, or a bush lot loaded with wild things that we can hunt, or a waterfront property. No, he doesn't promise that. The Lord promises us life forever with him. And Jesus speaks about the inheritance of the land in the book of Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This inheritance that is given to us by Jesus Christ, if we are in him, is wonderful. But we think so little about it. We're, we're focused on these earthly things, these earthly blessings, which are good, but sometimes we make them a little bit more important than they are. This inheritance is awesome, but we sometimes put more hope in these earthly treasures. And the hope of Christ ought to give us much delight. But sometimes we're prone to delight in the earthly treasures that we've been given. And they end up, when we delight in them and make them our idol, they give us sorrow. If we're in Christ, the Lord gives us the promise of the land. These promises include God dwelling in us.
Because of Christ, we will have no sorrow or sadness. Because of Christ, we'll be free from the sin that so easily entangles us. And the Lord will make all things new. Praise the Lord, because in Christ, we will inherit the land. Praise the Lord that we have this wonderful grace given to us that we can do nothing to receive. It's given by grace. And we have this wonderful hope through Christ. Thanks for watching and God bless.